The global death toll from COVID-19 topped 6 million recently. That, according to the World Health Organization, it is a staggering figure, but it might also be a massive underestimate. Let's find out more as we introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in London, UK, with Sandra Solstad, senior data journalist at The Economist. In Ann Arbor, Michigan, Brahmar Mukherjee, chair of biostatistics and professor of epidemiology at the University of Michigan and a member of the technical advisory group on COVID-19 mortality assessment at the World Health Organization. And in Sudbury, Ontario, Tara Moriarty, infectious disease researcher and associate professor at the University of Toronto and lead author on the Royal Society of Canada's report on mortality in Canada during the COVID-19 epidemic. It's good to have you three on our program tonight as we sort of look back two years ago this week to, um, well, something that changed everybody's lives rather significantly. Barbara, I wonder if I could start with you because we're going to show a chart in just a second that distinguishes between what they call official COVID deaths and excess COVID deaths. So let's start with a definition. What's the difference between those two? Yeah, so official COVID deaths are what you see in your favorite tracker, uh, be it the Bing tracker, be it New York Times, be it the Our World in Data. These are deaths that are reported by uh, Ministry of Health in different countries, official statistics departments. Different countries have different convention about who releases these numbers. So these are usually following and attached to a positive SARS-CoV-2 test, and sometimes there is a lag between reporting of deaths. But then the excess deaths are defined as the net difference between the total all-cause mortality that happened during the pandemic and the number that would have been expected had we followed past mortality trends. This is sort of a global summative measure of what happened to human mortality during the pandemic period. So the official deaths are COVID-related deaths that are mapped by released officially, and the excess deaths, it's sort of a, like a total toll of the pandemic. All right, with those two definitions and the distinction thereof now on the record, let's get the chart brought up and we'll go through this and we can see how the two columns really are really quite different. Here are the COVID, I'm gonna just uh, describe this a bit for those listening on podcast who can't see the numbers. This is COVID-19 deaths globally, and we have two columns here, official COVID deaths and then excess COVID deaths. And if you look at the global figure, it's 6 million official deaths, but the excess deaths takes us anywhere from almost 14 million to almost 24 million. How about in the United States? Official deaths, almost a million, but excess deaths between 1.2 and 1.3 million. In India, a significant difference, roughly half a million official deaths, but anywhere from nearly 2 million to nearly 10 million excess COVID deaths. In Russia, more than 350,000 official COVID deaths, more than a million excess COVID deaths. And how about us in Canada? It's actually the numbers are fairly uh, more synchronous here. More than 37,000 COVID deaths officially, but excess COVID deaths, anywhere from 16,000 to 46,000. All right, with those numbers now having been put on the record, Sandra, come on in here and say why you believe it's important to distinguish the difference between those two categories. Yeah, sure. So I think one thing that was learned very early on is that COVID-19 cases do not count COVID-19 infections, and COVID-19 deaths do not count all who die because of the pandemic. And so if you want an accurate picture of what the pandemic actually has looked like, you need to go to some other number, and that number is excess deaths. And so what we have done here at The Economist is that we have constructed a model to estimate excess deaths in all countries, and in that way obtain an accurate measure of the pandemic's true death toll. And we update this every morning. Is that to say, Sandra, that you do not believe the quote-unquote official COVID death number is accurate enough? What I believe is that excess deaths is both theoretically and practically superior as a measure of the pandemic's death toll. And I say that um, meaning that practically, it is unfortunately the case that in poor countries, testing is very limited. And that means that you will only capture a very small number of those who die of COVID-19 in the official death toll. Even in very rich countries, you see a difference between the number of people captured in excess death tolls and the number of people um, in the official death toll. 
Now, conceptually, there's also this difference, which is that exit that also captures things like overburdened hospitals and people not seeking health care, which is part of the pandemic and should be counted as such. Okay, understood. Tara, let me bring you in here at this point, and let's focus on the Canadian situation. And I wonder, because I know we've had great debates, even on this program, about what constitutes a death from COVID-19 versus with COVID-19, all of that. In your judgment, what comprises a, a COVID-19 death? Um, well, this is uh, a difficult uh, question to answer because a lot of people... Um, may die prematurely um, because, for example, say they have an underlying health condition and uh, COVID-19 infection uh, accelerates their death. Um, so the two together uh, work together to make the person uh, die sooner than they would have normally. So it's actually very hard to distinguish between deaths uh, with and of COVID. And what you really need to do is determine that statistically almost after the fact. So if you report all of your deaths as uh, recommended by the World Health Organization, the Public Health Agency of Canada, then you would uh, then you would report all deaths. Sorry, my cat's going to join. <laughs> uh, you would <laughs> go away, kitty. This will not be the first time that a pet tried to have a cameo on this program, so it's OK. No, I know. Um, so so you could determine that more readily after the fact because you can look at uh, what percentage of if you completely report your COVID deaths you can look at what percentage of them likely would have occurred um, in the particular age group of people how many of them would have died of other causes but trying to do it at the time um, is very challenging to do um, and and can lead to uh, a lot of underreporting of COVID deaths and I think we're going to see that with the excess mortality um, unfortunately, in Canada, death reporting um, for excess mortality is so delayed compared to most OECD countries that uh, we still really won't know what's happened in the Omicron wave, for example, for another year or so. Brahmar, let me get your view on whether, when we look back at the mortality of this coronavirus pandemic, whether we, in your judgment, should be looking at that first column, official COVID deaths, or at the second column, excess COVID deaths to get a fuller understanding of what this pandemic has wrought. I definitely agree that the second column is what we should look at because different countries have different quality and comprehensiveness of their death reporting system. And to this date, the world has not really agreed on a universal definition of what constitutes COVID death. But looking at the all-cause mortality data, gives us better appreciation of the pandemic because a lot of things have changed during the pandemic. So a major driver of these excess deaths, we do believe, is the COVID-19 disease. But there are also other causes because of delay in care, because of access to transportation. Uh, and so many, due to lockdown and many policy interventions, social behavior and economic forces have changed. So to grapple with that, I think we do need to look at the excess mortality number. Okay, let me do a follow-up with you. And Sheldon, can I get you to bring that graphic up one more time? Look at the middle of this chart, everybody. And I want to focus on India for a moment here. Over half a million deaths, official COVID deaths in India. But then look to the next column, excess COVID deaths, between almost 2 million and almost 10 million. Those numbers, Brahmar, are wildly divergent. Why such a big gap there? Yes, so as I mentioned, that different countries have different quality and comprehensiveness of the death reporting system. Even before the pandemic, the death registration system in India was quite insufficient. And the pandemic has really accentuated the stress the system. But also, as we know that, as Sondra mentioned, that there are low testing issues in various states across India. Another major issue is that if you look at the Lancet paper that came out on March 10th, that only 12 states have reported data. So we are reliant on it. That number, that interval that you see is very wide because there is not accurately reported all-cause mortality data over months in various states of India. That really necessitates that we have a strength and vital registration system across the world uh, in order to really quantify the deaths. 
But if you think about the second wave in India, a lot of deaths happened outside hospitals in rural areas. They were never recorded. So the 500,000 reported deaths is a gross underestimate. And any meta-analysis is saying that the actual toll is at least five to eight to 10 times more. All right, Sheldon, let's bring the chart up one more time because I want to focus on Russia this time. And again, we have a situation. Sandra, I'll put this to you. Four countries down. Russia, 353,000 and change official deaths. And then again, a wildly divergent number of much more than a million, between 1.2 and 1.3 million, for excess COVID deaths. And again, can you give us some understanding of why these numbers would be so divergent? Yes, sure. So Russia is actually a case where we have excellent data coming from the statistical services in that country on um, overall mortality. Now, for one reason or another, the official death count is way lower than that. Now, this is probably in part testing, as it is in many countries, um, but also a number of people, and including one researcher, has um, recently questioned some of the statistics of the country, pointing out that the variation you see in it um, is very unlikely to appear in natural numbers. Um, so to, to put it bluntly, in one week last year, the numbers varied so little that you would only see that in a comparable process every 2,400 years. Um, and so that points out to, or points to something nefarious perhaps going on. Such as? Mm -hmm. Such as maybe some countries don't want to report the official death toll and instead prefer to have, or don't want to report an accurate death toll and prefer to have a lower, um, perhaps more uh, politically expedient number. More politically expedient for their domestic audiences? Is that what you mean? That would be the suspicion, yes. Okay, gotcha. Uh, Tara, okay, let me get you back in here. Uh, we mentioned in the intro, you're the lead author on the Royal Society of Canada's report on mortality in Canada during this pandemic. Uh, tell us, in your judgment, how Canada has fared. Um, well, from the point of view of excess mortality, uh, I'd like to point uh, viewers to the, the numbers, the range of numbers that was listed for excess mortality for Canada. And you may have noticed that that lower number is actually lower than the number of reported deaths. Let's just say and it right now. We got 37,000 official COVID deaths yeah. and then only 16,000 potentially yeah. somewhere between yeah. 16 and 46,000 for excess COVID deaths. That's the only one where the, yes. where the, where the, the number in the excess column could be lower than the number in the official column. Yes, and so for the, the reason, uh, a major reason for that is the slowness of Canada's all-cause mortality death reporting. So, for example, we haven't seen completion of death reporting for wave one yet for Canada, and uh, we're getting closer to it. We'll probably be there by about June or so. And in wave one, uh, the, the ratio of um, reported COVID-19 deaths to excess mortality was considerably lower. So I think what we're going to see for Canada is that over a couple of years, we're going to see the, the lower bound of that excess mortality graph or uh, number rise considerably. Uh, we still don't have a lot of all-cause mortality reporting, even for wave two yet in Canada. And it's really hard to, um, to estimate where we are with excess mortality past the first wave, honestly. And, you know, related to the point about people dying in their homes, uh, there was a study of um, cremation data in Ontario for the first wave that looked at excess mortality via cremation data and found that, um, found that the majority of uh, excess mortality in Ontario in the first wave was actually in people's homes, not hospitals and not long-term care. Um, and that pattern has continued. So we do know there are a lot of people who aren't making it to hospital who are dying at home, whether by choice or um, because they don't know to come into hospital, they're avoiding medical care. And certainly for the first and second waves, uh, based on seroprevalence data, it looks like all of excess mortality was COVID-19, at least in 2020. But we really don't have good enough numbers in Canada uh, really past November of 2020 to, uh, to really form firm conclusions about a lot of this. And I think we're going to find out over a couple of years that, um, that the epidemic has had quite a bit of a higher death toll than we expected. Tara, I have to do this follow-up, and I'm really trying not to smart, yes. sound like a smart aleck when I ask this question, but we're a G7 country, for yeah. goodness sakes. We fancy ourselves yeah. as having one of the best 
healthcare systems in the world, and certainly yeah. with an ability to report on what transpires in that healthcare system, how is it possible we're still three waves behind in our reporting of what's transpired? T two years behind, uh, not even three weeks. Um, uh, you know, it's Canada's death reporting system. It hasn't, it is not particularly digitally integrated. It has fallen far behind. It has the slowest death reporting rate among OECD countries. Uh, we don't have legal requirements that deaths be reported in a timely fashion um, to uh, nationally. We're still sending, fa doing it by fax and mail. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. And this has been known for a long time, um, but the COVID epidemic, COVID-19 epidemic has has really accentuated the problem with death reporting in this country. Um, there are other things that Canada actually tests uh, a fair bit less per capita than a uh, major um, high income, mid, uh, medium and large OECD countries. Um, and really within this country, the, the only province that uh, tests and reports deaths um, as would be expected and in a timely fashion, um, it would be back. So we have excellent data coming out of Quebec in Canada, but largely for the rest of the country, uh, we are missing a considerable number of expected uh, reported COVID-19 deaths at, based on case estimates. And uh, we have a problem outside of Quebec and Canada. One more fast follow-up. Why would Quebec be any better than everybody mm -hmm. else? Well, Quebec, uh, uh, you know, probably about 20 years ago, started centralizing and really um, improving its its health data reporting in general, not just reporting of deaths. So they've been doing this for a long time. They they took that modernization leap about 20 years ago or started it, and uh, they're excellent at doing that. The other thing is that Quebec also does post-mortem testing on people. They do COVID-19 testing on people who might have died at home, for example, uh, where something looks like a COVID-19 death and um, they want to test because the person hasn't had access to testing before they died. Other provinces don't do that. And so even if someone dies at home of something that looks like COVID, um, probably is COVID based on, you know, other people in the home being infected, um, they won't be tested and that death won't be reported as COVID-19. And that's a major problem. Gotcha. Brahmar, when you are doing your modeling, where do you get your information from? So uh, there are different components of the model. So uh, I uh, defined excess mortality as a difference of two quantities. And one number was that what is the observed all-cause mortality? And different uh, mortality databases, human mortality database, the world mortality database, the global data health exchange, there are several data sites which actually releases these observed all-cause mortality data. But then there are also uh, missing data because many countries do not report it. Many countries do not report it at the time and space resolution uh, that you'd like it to be. So there comes models in order to get to that estimated uh, all-cause mortality data or excess mortality data. And Saunders Cooper and others have done a lot of detailed work. But then you also need for what you do expect had the pandemic not happened. For that piece of forecasting, you need historical past trends of good maybe last decade of mortality data with secular trends and seasonal trends so that you can predict what did you expect if the pandemic did not happen? And then you take a difference of these two counterfactuals to come up with the number. So if we have good data, that's much easier than to model your way out of bad data or data positive. I understand. Uh, obviously, some of this requires you, therefore, to use your uh, education, your background, your training to, to do informed speculation. And for that reason, I guess I've got to ask, how confident are you that you actually get to, quote unquote, the truth at the end of the day? So this is a very important question for any statistician or modeler to understand and uh, or to be able to answer that there is always uncertainty estimates. So you saw that in your second column in the graph that you showed that there is a range of intervals. 
people make different choices with respect to their models. Uh, for example, the Lancet paper that appeared in, on March 10th with a worldwide estimate of uh, excess mortality used six different models to get at the, the those expected counts had the pandemic had not observed and took a, takes a weighted approach or an ensembling approach to make these uh, estimates robust. But that's why we provide a range, because we are not absolutely certain. But the, even the lower bound of that range is enough to show you for some countries this underreporting has been huge. But of course, we, bid mod, we build models, but we do a lot of sensitivity analysis with respect to choice of models as well. Sandra, let me follow up with you. When you are doing your mortality modeling and you are taking into account all of your your training, your statistical education, and so on, what factors do you take into consideration to make sure you're getting the best possible result? I think uh, one very important thing is to be very humble and to realize that you are operating in, in an environment where, in many cases, there is very little data available. And then the only truthful and honest thing you can do is to give a very wide range, uh, like we did for India and, and you saw previously. Um, in other cases, you can be more confident in places with uh, good data, such as, say, the United States or, or countries in the European Union. Now, I think also a key thing is to always test your models. So to come up with these estimates, we tested a, a range of different models and, and then compare them to each other and pick the one that performed the best. And we did that by looking at how well it performed if you know you took some of the data and then use that to train a model and then predict it on some other data that this former model hadn't seen. And in doing tricks like that, you can come up with a good sense of how well your models will do um, once it is applied to, to the real world data. Now, do I have this right that you at The Economist like to use machine learning in helping you get to your estimates? Is that right? That is correct, yes. So we tried many different approaches and we found that machine learning was uh, the optimal approach in this case. Now, the reason is quite simple, which is that uh, these new uh, tools allow you to be very, very flexible. So you could have things like um, deep interactions, meaning that one variable might influence the ultimate outcome through some other variable, through a third variable, and so on and so forth. And that makes the models more accurate. So in, in a concrete case, you could imagine something like the testing rate being important, but also in relation to the test positivity rate. and that might in turn be especially important in a country with a very young population or a very old population or, or some other such variable. And there is where machine learning tools come really in handy. All right. Conversely, Bramar, I gather you do not use machine learning. You use more traditional sources and methods. Do, I mean, do you think Sandra's got it better or do you like your way better? So I think there is merit in both uh, options. That's I'm a not very diplomatic to... answer. <laughs> no, I'm not going to, because in my work also, I uh, use machine learning often. The compartmental models of disease transmission actually targets at a different quantity. So because it is directly modeling COVID-19 transmission, it can give you better ideas about what is the COVID-19 related deaths, because you are focusing on that. Uh, but that also makes assumption that the infection fatality rate or the deaths that go into the model are accurate. So I think that either you use machine learning or traditional models, I think the basic fundamental denominator that I want to say is that you need good data and we need to encourage countries to give us age and sex and comorbidity disaggregated data uh, over time and over at, at the geographical uh, region. Well, Tara, this may be obvious, but let's yeah. put the question on the record anyway. Good data yeah. is important for public policy decision makers because why? Um, because you need to know what has actually been happening or your best approximation of it to make decisions about what has helped, what will help, um, and what is going to happen. And those are absolutely crucial for policy. And uh, policymakers need that information to be able to respond in a timely and effective fashion. How satisfied are you that Canadian decision makers have at their disposal, the best possible, most accurate data that they can get their hands on to make sure they're making the best decisions. 
Uh, certainly at this point in the epidemic, uh, not at all, because we are testing at such a low rate. We don't have surveillance. We're not doing uh, rapid ser seroprevalence studies such as are being done in the US. Uh, we have a real paucity of data in Canada at this point in the epidemic, and uh, it's really quite hard to know what's happening. And um, it's pretty concerning right now. That is deeply concerning. Sandra, how about take us to the other end of the spectrum. Which country in the world does the best job at getting this the most accurate? I think that the UK actually has done an excellent job, at least now, um, once it's got its, all its system up and working. So one thing that I really hope other countries will um, decide to do, perhaps in a future pandemic, perhaps in this one, is to do more um, seroprevalence surveys and, and to get a sense of what is happening by taking data from a random sample of the population. That is, I think, the best way to, to get an accurate real-time sense of what is going on. And then in addition, I would just echo the, echo the call for better all-cause mortality data. Uh, this is the basis not just for COVID-19 and pandemic death toll modeling, but a lot of other important work as well. And in many countries, it is severely lacking and it precludes good decisions from being made. I guess I'd want your view on that as well, Brahmar. Which country in the world do you think does the best job since Canada seems to be a bit of a laggard on this right now? I think that I agree with Sonder that UK has done a fantastic job. I also think if you look at uh, the uh, the estimates from various different sources, Israel has done a fabulous job. Uh, Denmark has done a good job. I think that the countries which have integrated data system and universal health coverage through some, either it is through a uh, you know, government agency or a medical insurance system, which has a huge coverage throughout the country, where the data, different types of data cross talk, like the sequencing data and the testing data and the clinical outcome data are immediately being linked and reported. Those are the countries where you do not have to go map back the cause of death. And I think that they have done a fabulous job that really underscores that the need for integrated and robust public health data systems. We've just got a couple of minutes left here, but Brahmar, I would be interested in your views on, for those countries that are laggards in this, and apparently we're one of them, what can they and we do to up our game? I think this problem of having a robust vital registration system as an important component of public health has been recognized for a long time. Now we are really experiencing this due to the pandemic, but there has to be incentive in the regular death reporting system. For example, in rural areas in India, how can you incentivize families to report deaths that happened outside the hospital? There can be other crowdsourcing uh, uh, options, for example, you know, inactive cell phones, bank accounts, um, in, in, in case of India, inactive Aadhaar cards, which is the social security card. So I think we really need to do crowdsourcing and use all the tools that we have in our power in order to come up with more accurate measures of mortality. And this is for future pandemic, because in, you know, in case an infection is such a nebulous metric, death is a much more concrete metric. In order to know the death, it helps models, it helps better policy, and then you know what is actually going on with the population and the impact of a health crisis on public health in general. Well, the one thing I know about statistics is garbage in, garbage out. If you don't get good data in, you're yeah. not going to make good decisions coming out the other side. Exactly. And I want to thank you three. Yeah. Can I call you this? You three stats nerds for coming onto our program tonight and sharing your expertise so expertly with us. Uh, Sandra Solstad, Tara Moriarty, Brahmar Mukherjee from right to left on our screens. Thank you so much for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you for championing statistics. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> the Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.